Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. They're warning about editing DNA and striking down an ag-gag law. But first, U.S. allows ally Turkey to bomb the only group effectively fighting ISIS. Now, this comes via the anti-media who reported in late July that Turkey joined the U.S.-led coalition conducting airstrikes against the Islamic State, IS, ISIS, ISIL. Since then, it has become clear that Turkey's strategy is part of a larger agreement with the U.S. to conduct a war against extremism in the region. The deal between the U.S. and Turkey has the following contours. Turkey will allow the U.S. to use its military base at Incirlik to conduct airstrikes against the Islamic State. In exchange, the U.S. will allow Turkey to create a buffer zone on Syrian soil free of Islamic State and Kurdish fighters. The stated aim of this safe zone is to create a refuge for internally displaced Syrian civilians inside Syria. According to the New York Times, quote, the plan would create what officials from both countries are calling an Islamic State free zone, controlled by relatively moderate Syrian insurgents, which the Turks say could also be a safe zone for displaced Syrians. Now, James, this anti-media article goes on, but basically we break it down and the real aim of Turkey is to fight the Kurds, not ISIS, correct? That is exactly right, and this will not come as a surprise to the Corbett reporters who participated in the creation of our open source investigation on who created ISIS last year, which uh, I think continues to hold up. Uh, yes, Turkey was one of the, the countries uh, that has been actively supporting and aiding and abetting uh, the creation and the fostering of ISIS since the beginning. Uh, for a couple of different reasons. First of all, of course, to destabilize regional rival and uh, uh, pipeline transit rival Syria, but also, of course, as an excuse to crack down on the Kurds. Because, yes, Turkey always is looking for an excuse to crack down on the Kurds, and here's the perfect excuse. So they're setting up this border region, this no, no-go no zone, where it's going to be, oh, we'll, we'll take care of ISIS in this region, but of course it's about taking care of the Kurds. And, uh, again, this should not come as any surprise. Uh, the only thing that's interesting, I think, in all of this is that we're definitely seeing some big moves with regards to Syria in the re- in recent months, as you're going to uh, outline here in a minute. And I think one of the uh, interesting signs of those big moves and the fact they're preparing for something is the fact that they're trotting out a lot of anti, uh, uh, a lot of kind of destabilization propaganda when it comes to Russia and its relation to Syria. So we've seen the rumor floated that Putin is about to ditch Assad. We've also seen the rumor floated that uh, Putin called the Turkish ambassador in and, and basically called her to want a dictator both of which claims have been denied. In fact, the Russians have come out and said, we're actually, we've got paratroopers ready to go into Syria if, if need be. So there's definitely some propaganda work trying to uh, perhaps put some tension in that Syria-Russia relationship. And I think that's a sign that we're going to see some, some big fireworks soon when it comes to Syria. So I can just outline that with just a few other headlines, James. Via The Guardian, U.S.-trained Syrian rebels refuse to fight al-Qaeda group after kidnappings. They're called Division 30. They've endured a campaign of kidnappings by the Nusra Front. They also oppose American airstrikes carried out against al-Qaeda-linked fighters. Now, an interesting one from Corbett dressing up as ISIS. What could possibly go wrong, James? The elite British SAS forces, forces are dispatching over 120 troops to Syria to dress up as ISIS fighters and attack Syrian targets. Now, how well is this going to go, James? Uh, I'm imagining not very well. Well, I guess it depends on what perspective you're looking from. If you're looking from the perspective of stirring up tensions, creating false flag events, and creating the, the context and the narrative to justify some sort of greater military incursion... I'm sure it can go very well for those people, but for uh, the rest of humanity, uh, the other 99.9999% of humanity who doesn't want to see war in Syria, I don't think there's any good that can come of this. And the last headline for you here, James, the always suspicious SITE organization, S-I-T-E, says ISIS has launched their own Android app. Now, of course, you can't get it in the Google Play Store the normal way, but allegedly there's code that you can just run on your phone. So again, James, I love to think about the difference between if you upload uh, some illegal Dr. Dre song versus I'm a terrorist organization and I've got an app on the phone. And it's it makes very little sense when you actually kind of break it down, doesn't it? Well, it doesn't make sense if we trust the uh, the official narratives that, of course, they want to crack down on these terrorists. But I think we know we know better. 
so we'll leave that there for our first set of stories. And again, something that I, I think in a lot of ways, what we try and do here on New World Next Week is kind of lay it out and do it in a next week style and give you the information, hopefully, that, that points to what's actually going on in the world. So we'll move to our second segment this week on episode 235 of New World Next Week, if you're keeping score. Caution urged over editing DNA in wildlife. Now, this comes from the journal Nature. Crap was the first word out of Kevin S. Velt's mouth as he scanned a paper published in Science last March. The work described the use of a gene editing technique to insert a mutation into fruit flies that would be passed on to almost all of their offspring. Although intriguing, the report made S. Velt feel uneasy. If an engineered fly escaped from the lab, the mutation could spread quickly through a wild population. But that's exactly what excited molecular biologist Anthony James at the University of California, Irvine. Holy mackerel, he wrote to the study's authors. Can we use it in mosquitoes? Echoing Bill Gates sentiments from years past. On July 30th, just a week ago, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, the NAS, held the first in a series of meetings meant to find a way to balance the promise and perils of the technique called gene drive. The method can rapidly modify not just a single organism, but a whole population by inserting a, gen a desired genetic modification into an organism, along with DNA that increases the rate at which the change is passed to the next generation. So this idea of gene drive has been around for more than a decade, but it got a big boost about three years ago with the breakthrough and the arrival of something called CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R, a gene editing technique that allows precise changes to an organism's DNA. So, mindful of both the potential and the risks, S. Velt, a bioengineer at Harvard Medical School in Boston, brought together a group of scientists to write a comment in Science, published last week, laying out the need for multiple containment strategies for gene-drive research that's done in the laboratory. So, meanwhile, the NAS meeting marked the start of a 15-month search for ways to minimize the risk in advance of field releases. Now, this article from Nature goes on to say, well, that's plenty of time. We should have time to, to get everything straight. But I'm going to lay out a few other sources, James, and I think it shows, uh, it paints a bigger picture. So we'll move to thehill.com, just your, your basic Capitol Hill muckety-muck blog, where the last scientist in Congress has a human genetic engineering warning. His name is Representative Bill Foster, and he writes, quote, It's rare that prominent members of the scientific community come together to warn our leaders of technological breakthroughs that our legal system and society are not prepared for. As the last scientist with a Ph.D. remaining in Congress, I feel a responsibility to transmit those concerns to my colleagues and to the public. And he goes on to describe what I just described for you, which is this new CRISPR breakthrough. James, I find it really interesting that he refers to himself as the last and not currently the only or, or something like that, as in there won't be any more. It's all lawyers and hucksters from here on. So two other headlines, James, and I'll throw it back to you. Genetic engineering for our babies is real. This is from New York Magazine. It could at last allow genetic researchers to conjure everything anyone has ever worried they would. Designer babies, invasive mutants, species-specific bioweapons, and a dozen other apocalyptic sci-fi tropes. And finally, we wrap it up with accuracy in media. AIM.org. The hidden politics of abortion. Genetic modification. For all the concern expressed over the use of genetically modified organisms, GMOs, in the trees in one major area, that abortion is part of a dangerous global picture, the selective genetic engineering of human beings. This radical dysfunction is fueled by politically contrived demands. Now, James, I think what's really telling is that how many different sources, AIM, New York Magazine, The Hill, and the journal Nature are all in agreement. And I think it's really interesting that this comes at a pretty contentious confluence of conversations about organ harvesting and Planned Parenthood and Cecil the Lion and these digital lynch mobs, all, I think, areas worthy of their own episodes of New World Next Week. But James, how do we deal with editing DNA? Well, I think you're right to stress that it's interesting that all of these different sources are converging on, on the same topics, because this shows there really is something developing in these areas, and I think this is really the culmination of many of the things that we've been talking about respectively in our own work and together here on The New World Next Week for years and years now when it comes to eugenics and genetic modification and all of these crazy uh, advances, advances in technology. 
And the question, what do we do about it, is a particularly problematic one, because it's so much out of our hands. Obviously, we can't directly control what scientific research is going on, at least not individually. But let's try to put something resembling a positive note in here. And uh, people who subscribe to my newsletter will know that one of my recommended readings from last week was uh, an article from testbiotech.org. UK company plans to release genetically engineered flies in Spain. Talking about the UK company Oxitec planning to release genetically engineered olive flies into the environment in Catalonia, Spain. The insects are genetically manipulated in such a way that female descendants will die as larvae feeding inside the olives, while the next generations of male flies will survive. The intention of Oxitec is that the male transgenic flies will mate with the female native flies and thereby introduce their artificial genes into the native population, and as a result, it is thought that the population of native olive flies will decrease and eliminate economic da- damage to all of production. So this uh, story is talking about this and and has uh, uh, some quotes from some uh, anti-GM groups uh, around Europe that are very concerned about this open-air experiment of releasing these transgenic flies into the environment, and it goes on to list all of the different organizations that have signed uh, a protest against this idea, Amigos de la Tierra, Agrobio, Biotech Watch, Cregen, all of these different organizations across Europe. Well, on a Good news next week note, I just got this in from an uh, email from a listener. It looks like they are, in fact, not going to go ahead uh, with this this introduction. And I have a Spanish language link uh, that I'll throw in the show notes for people. Basically, uh, Oxitec is withdrawing their application for these GMO olive flies because confinement of this population will be impossible. So I think this, perhaps it's the Nature article, perhaps it's these various organizations, but bringing attention and awareness to these issues can at least influence and perhaps delay some of these uh, these big t- uh, open-air experiments that are going on. There's still much more work that needs to be done, of course, so I think we have to really raise the, the red flag that something is really going wrong here, and we need to to, uh, to bring a, a greater cultural awareness to this topic so that we can get off of talking about flags and lions and talk a little bit more about the future of the genome of the human sp- uh, species and the planet itself. And I think you set us up quite well for our last segment this week where we pretty much always have discussed good news, and that's the good news next week. And we encourage people to tweet good news that we may have missed using hashtag good news next week. Idaho rules anti-whistleblower ag-gag law unconstitutional. This via activist post. The old maxim that if you knew how sausage was made, you'd never eat it has been highlighted quite literally by many undercover videos taken by activists, employees of factory farming ops, and even farmers themselves. So in response, the industry increasingly lobbied for ag-gag, agricultural gags. Laws that criminalize whistleblowing and undercover investigations, essentially rendering animal cruelty completely invisible. These laws have already resulted in egregious attempts at prosecutions like the National Geographic photographer arrested for taking aerial photographs near a feedlot and another arrest of activists who released mink from a fur farm. In a later case, they were actually indicted as terrorists. However, even though ag-gag laws have taken hold in seven states in America, it has not been a slam dunk for the big ag industry or its supporters. State governors in Tennessee and North Carolina have vetoed initiatives, as have nearly 20 other states. However, Idaho now becoming a ground zero for what could indicate a complete federal overruling of any state where these laws appear. And we'll continue this via an article from Tech Dirt. An anti-whistleblower ag-gag law ruled unconstitutional where this court in Idaho doesn't mince words in their 28-page ruling, and we will include that PDF for you. Noting that under this law, Upton Sinclair's The Jungle would likely have been illegal. And James, I wonder if they still actually have people well, read The we Jungle. did, where basically Upton Sinclair's muckraking ex- expose of the disgusting conditions in Chicago stockyards in the early 20th century would have basically been illegal. So, James, we do have that PDF and even a little bit more good news there for you. Absolutely. Please do read through that decision, because as Tech Dirt notes, they really don't mince words in here. And I'll just highlight one section in there that's uh, worth highlighting. 
Uh, the In the decision, the judge writes, the overwhelming evidence gleaned from the legislative history indicates that S-187042 was intended to silence animal welfare activists or other will- whistleblowers who seek to publish speech critical of the agricultural production industry. Many legislators made their intent crystal clear by comparing animal rights activists to terrorists, per- perse- persecutors, vigilantes, blackmailers, and invading marauders who swarm into foreign territory and destroy co- crops to starve foes into submission. Other legislators accused animal rights groups of being extreme activists who contrive issues solely to bring in donations or to purposely defame agricultural facilities. And uh, the judge then goes on to to basically eviscerate that and show how it is unconstitutional to try to pass anti-whistleblower laws like this. Well, uh, I should know a thing or two about that living in Japan where there was that secrecy law uh, passed here just a year or so ago. So um, th- th- obviously governments around the world love to be able to try to pass this type of legislation for the uh, benefit of their corporate cronies who of course benefit from having all of their activities placed under a cover it's very heartening that this decision has been made and hopefully this will turn around these ridiculous ag gag uh, laws of course there's again still a lot of work to go in terms of really protecting whistleblowers uh, in the United States context let alone the world context but uh, this is a small step in the right direction so some good news indeed So let's get a couple of other good news next week updates. Tech leaders urge ban on AI warfare. Nestle India sales dropped 20% after a Maggie Noodle recall. There's a miracle motorbike that goes at 500 kilometers or 300 miles on a single liter of water. And a slightly fun note before we get into some of the darker New World next week headlines. Marijuana found growing in Vancouver, B.C. traffic circles. So having said that, you can submit good news stories using hashtag good news next week. And as well, all the people who give us fantastic updates using hashtag new world next week, like our good friends and editor Brock West, Super Core Heroes, Naz Alt Theory, Seven Robots, Inc., J.G. Salisbury, of course, and more. Submitting stories as we come to you right now, Hiroshima and Nagasaki anniversaries, again, the worst terror attacks in history. Pennsylvania might become the first state to use pre-crime statistics in criminal sentencing. Speaking of criminal sentencing, George W. Bush does jury duty, and there's a funny photo of it. Meanwhile, former U.K. Prime Minister Ted Heath accused of rape by a victim who was 12 at the time as the pedophile, pedophile politician continues to be exposed, I think. Bin Laden family members killed in a plane crash. Amy Schumer joins her cousin Chuck's call for gun control, and German government launches investigation of journalists for treason, which is a great way to, I think, kind of wrap up this episode and say, we will not be prosecuted for treason. We are giving you non-commercial, open-source information, and that's what we do here on New World Next Week. James? And let's continue to do it. Uh, James, this is uh, very important information. I hope people use the show notes as the resource they are, and I'm looking forward to doing it again with you next week. Thanks, man.